I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Thank you for joining us for our series of videos, Practical Advice from Successful Farmers. Today the topic is sweet potatoes and we'll be hearing from and learning from Curtis Millsap of Millsap Farms near Springfield, Missouri. Welcome to Millsap Farm. I'm Curtis Millsap and we're here today to talk about sweet potatoes. It's sweet potato harvest season, but we're gonna talk about how sweet potatoes work on our farm and why we grow them, how we grow them, and how we sell them. Millsap Farm is a 25 acre farm four miles north of Springfield, Missouri, down in the southwest corner of Missouri. So we are in the Ozarks. We have fairly thin soils. We've been growing vegetables here organically for 16 years, and we grow a real wide mix of vegetables. Basically, the only things we don't grow would be winter squash and melons. Um, those two we've had difficulty doing organically, but sweet potatoes are a big part of our mix, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that is, and then tell you how we've figured out our best system for growing them, uh, which has been trial and error over the years. So, on our farm, um, we grow about two and a half acres of vegetables, so every row, every bed has to earn its keep, and the, and the sweet potatoes really have been a performer for the last five years or so. It took us a while to figure it out, so 16 years of farming, the last five years we finally got our sweet potatoes dialed in, but that's why we're here to share today because we feel like we have a system that's working really well and is worth sharing. So sweet potatoes start with ground prep, and for us ground prep starts the, the autumn before. So when we think about where we're, gonna, where we're gonna plant our potatoes, then we're looking for a well-drained site. Of course, optimally, we'd love to have some good levels of organic matter, but we're in the Ozarks, so we usually don't start that way. So when we start prepping for the fall, sweet potatoes are one of my favorite spots to add a lot of compost. We'd make a lot of compost on farm. Uh, it's part of soil building in the Ozarks, is, is a lot of compost addition. And our compost is a light compost, meaning not a heavy nitrogen compost. It's more like a decomposed wood chip. So what we'll do is spread a lot of compost, maybe three or four inches in the fall, and we'll seed rye into that. And so this is just spreading either right on top of a grass pasture or we may tarp that area beforehand and then we'll spread that compost. Seed directly after we spread the compost. Sometimes we've even spread most of our compost and then dropped a little bit of compost over the top. Now I'm not doing any tillage beforehand, so that's an important detail. And then I'm seeding that, that rye fairly heavy. I want a good stand, a little heavier than what you get recommended, partly because I don't have a drill and so my rye is going to be exposed to the elements. It's going to be up near the surface and so it's not going to have optimal germination, so I want to make sure that I, I seed it fairly heavy. So the rye is going to germinate, come up, grow all winter. Now, meantime, it's going to really take off in February and start growing intently. And usually by May or so, we have a shoulder high, a stand of rye that's, that's making, in fact, even be seven feet high sometimes, and making heads. What I'm looking for is I want those heads to be, the seeds to be in milk stage. So when you squeeze rye and it lets out a little milky juice, that's milk stage. The reason we want it to be there is because we're going to terminate it by knocking it down. We're not going to mow it, we're not going to rototill it, we're not going to plow it, any of that stuff. We're just going to knock it down. In our case, what we use is the bucket on the tractor and we roll the rototiller behind it. The rototiller is not engaged, we're just using it as a roller crimper. Of course, if we had a roller crimper, wouldn't that be spiffy? But we get away with this and it works quite well. Sometimes I will run over it twice just to make sure I've really knocked it down. It should lay right down. It should make a beautiful grown in place mulch. Then, because I'm compost rich and also because I'm often using sweet potatoes as a pioneer crop, I'm often going into something that was a pasture the year before or has been uh, fallowed for a couple years, something like that, so it's fairly unused soil, I'm going to go in and dump more compost. And this time I'm going to dump my compost and then I'm going to make it into a windrow, uh, a ridge we could call it. And so that ridge ideally is going to be about, uh, I'd like it to be about two feet wide at the bottom and about a foot tall. Um, and that's, you know, it'll be a little bit bigger than that when I first run through it with the, with the disc set to hill, but then it'll settle a little as it gets wet. But I want it to be, I want it to end, I'd like it to be at least a foot tall. Sometimes it's a little less, but I find it's better if it's a little taller. And it's gonna be a nice cone shape. And that's what's gonna contain most of our sweet potatoes when we go to harvest. Um, some of them will get down into the ground, but for the most part, they're gonna be in that ridge of compost. And we'll come back to why that's important later. So let's talk about slip production, uh, which is what's happening as our cover crop's growing, right? So about the middle of March, we're gonna go out and buy a bushel of potatoes or pull potatoes out of storage. 
Now, if you're going to pull the potatoes out of storage, of course, you want them to be solid, no scurf, no noticeable defects. And oftentimes, we'll just buy a, a, a bushel of potatoes from a, an organic retailer, or we could, I guess, you know, special order them or something. But for the most part, ours are coming from either our own store, our own stock, that is, or uh, an organic grocery store. I don't know that it matters that they're organic, other than there is a possibility they would spray them with a sprout inhibitor if you were to buy them from a conventional place. So it's probably wise to get organic potatoes for this, even if you're not an organic grower. Now you're gonna dump a bushel of potatoes just as close as they can be. So we're just gonna lay those potatoes in there side by side on top of a bed, and they can be touching. We don't want them overlapping each other, but we want them single thickness, bumping up against one another. And then we're gonna dump compost over the top of the whole thing. And we usually add about three to four inches of compost. We want a pretty good coverage. It can even be six or eight, it won't hurt anything. And then we cover that bed with plastic. We've done it with green plastic, we've done it with black plastic. I couldn't tell you there was a big difference on that. What is important is the plastic. And this is under a tunnel, on a bed, under plastic now, under a plastic bed cover. And then we have done them with and without row cover on top of that. Again, couldn't tell you that I've seen a big difference with the row cover, but definitely the plastic is worth doing, partly because it suppresses those early weeds, but also because it does help the soil warm up and then retain that warmth and moisture. So potatoes are in the ground, under compost, uh, well-matured compost, under a layer of plastic, inside of a tunnel, and now you're going to leave them alone. And in about four weeks, you'll start seeing them pop up just a little bit underneath the plastic. And that's your key to get the plastic off of them. So you're going to cut that plastic or pull it off the top, and you'll see just tiny little baby shoots starting to pop up. Those grow relatively fast, as you would imagine. They are sweet potatoes, and so they're going to jump up. And within uh, another two weeks, they're going to be plenty big that we could plant them out. So we've got our compost, and we've got another probably, you know, they should be about six inches tall about the time you start thinking about putting them out. Now, there's two ways you can go at that point depending on what your soil prep is like and how ready you are and what the weather's doing. You can either, and we've done both of these, we can either trim them off at the top so we can take the top couple inches off of them and that hardens them up a little bit, slows them down. Kind of, it's kind of like hardening off plants by setting them outside. We're just toughing these up a little bit. And if you do that, then you need to give them about a week to heal before you set them out in the field. Otherwise, you can just come in and cut off right at the soil surface and take those slips now, that's what we're gonna call those, those little baby sweet potato plants. They don't have roots, they are just vines and leaves, but we're gonna cut those off, and they need to be minimum four inches. They can be as long as you want, but, but minimum four inches. And then we're gonna stick those in our beds. We're gonna take that slip and we're just gonna stick it right in the top of that ridge. We use a stick, very fancy tool here. We find a stick and you're gonna mark a length on it, one foot, between plants, that's what we do. And then we stick that stick in the ground, we're gonna pick up, put our slip in there and just gently tuck it back in. And we're gonna do that all the way down the line. We're just sticking these, remember these are just little four to eight inch tall slips, pieces of sweet potato vine, they're going in the ground. And I will point out, the ground needs to be moist. So if we've had some dry, or if it hasn't rained since you spread the compost, in our case, sometimes that'll happen, we're gonna pre-irrigate. And this is a practice we adopted a number of years ago, really for almost anything we're gonna transplant. We want the soil to be ready for those plants. Now we can't obviously plant in mud, so we don't wanna get it so wet that it's gonna be you know, working mud, but we do want it to be nice and wet and then you know, dried out enough to work. And the reason for that is we want these slips, which are just you know, chunks of vine, to go into an environment where they're almost immediately gonna start growing. So pre-irrigate, we're going through there with our stick, every foot, we're sticking our slips in, and then, you know, before you know it, you've got 100 slips and a 100 foot bed or a ridge. I am doing one ridge per five foot wide bed. So my, my bed system is a five foot wide system. So I've just got one ridge of potatoes. We've tried out two ridges, we've tried out different versions, and we have found that really, for us, it seems to work best to just do a single ridge down the middle of the five foot wide bed, and that still seems to give us our best yield. We've played around with different versions of that and that they, they use that space well. Once they start vining out, they really use all that photosynthetic space. So we wanna give them that whole five foot wide swath to grow into. Okay, so then we're, uh, there we are, slips in the ground. Now we're also gonna roll out in our case, we're using overhead irrigation. You could do this with drip irrigation. Keeping drip irrigation on top of ridges is very difficult, which is why we quit doing drip for sweet potatoes. So we just do an overhead irrigation system. Pretty simple, tripod sprinklers. 
We want to make sure that it covers the whole area evenly or at least reasonably well. And we're, as soon as we are done planting slips, we're going to turn it on. In fact, I have planted slips in the rain. Uh, nothing wrong with that at all. But you want them to be watered, and I want them to water them every day for about five days. Sometimes a couple times a day. If it's really hot, I'll go ahead and turn those sprinklers on a schedule, and I'll go ahead and irrigate those slips three, three or even four times a day for the first several days. Now, you get past five days or so, you'll see a big difference. The first day, the slips will wilt off. They'll look pretty sad. That's what the irrigation is for. They should perk up overnight, but they'll probably wilt again the next day. They may do that three or four days. By day five or six, they should really stop wilting. And that's the point at which they're starting to take off and grow. And that's what we're looking for. Um, often at that point, we'll walk through the field and we'll check and see if we have misses. This is a great opportunity to sub in. You know, we, these are a high value crop. We're growing them all season long. They're taking up a lot of real estate. We want to make sure that we're making the most out of our beds. So we're going to walk through with a handful of extra slips and plug in any extras that we might need. Usually, though, we have a really high success rate on the slips taking off. Unless, unless we have some fault with our irrigation, it works really well, even in really hot and oppressive weather. And let me tell you, we're, we're in the Ozarks. We understand hot and oppressive. It can be 90-something you know, degrees in that uh, we're talking here now middle of May to the middle of June. So this is kind of a four-week, really a six-week. We can go to the end of June, as late as the end of June, to plant these sweet potatoes. So in that time frame, we can get quite hot and dry. And so we want to make sure that we have irrigation, but they don't seem to mind the heat. All right. So there are sweet potato vines. Now our slips are set. They're in place. So from now on, it's going to be weed control and irrigation. Now, uh, word on weed control. Obviously, prevention is easier than fixing it after the fact. So we've actually invested in ground fabric, ground cover. that We call it a, it's a DeWitt black woven tarp. And it's six feet wide. And it goes from ridge top to ridge top, and then a little bit, we'll fold it under so we make sure we have as much as we need. And we'll lay those down and we'll put sandbags on them or even little uh, landscape staples to keep them in place. And we'll leave that until our vines really start growing. So that's usually four weeks or so. And in that four weeks, we're going to get, well, of course, there's all these weeds that are going to pop up even through that nice rye mulch that we're growing on, they still get a lot of weeds that'll pop up through that, and that tarp kills them all. So the only thing we have to weed is the very ridge top. This has been a huge time savings, uh, well worth the investment in the fabric. And we're not doing a small number of these. We're doing typically about 1,400 row feet, so 14 beds. And so we've got, you know, 14 pieces of fabric that we lay out there. You can, and we have done at times, kind of cycle them, do half the fabric and then move it over after a couple of weeks, and that is okay. But uh, either way, it's a great way to solve your weed problem. There is usually a couple of hand weedings in there. So typically we'll have to go through once right there early on and grab the small weeds as they pop up. And then usually after they vined out a bit, we'll make another pass through and do a second hand weeding. But these are pretty quick because all you're weeding it's just that area, that little band on top of the ridge where the tarps don't come to. And so usually by four weeks, we've got the vines are starting to really make some progress. They're starting to slide down the sides of those ridges. They probably reach the bottom of the path. And that's your last opportunity to remove the fabric. So <laughs> if you don't remove the fabric now, then the fabric's there for the duration. We like to remove it because we're going to use it in other places on the farm. And it also does simplify harvest if you get the fabric out of the way. Okay, so we've got the sweet potatoes established. They're relatively weed free. We're going to keep an eye on that because they are a vigorous grower, but we have definitely seen in weedy sweet potato patches, we have a greatly diminished yield. So it's well worth the time and energy spent weeding. And then we're going to make sure it stays irrigated. Now, you've heard, I'm sure, and it's very true that sweet potatoes are a very drought hardy crop. And it's true. You can grow sweet potatoes without irrigation. But if you want to grow lots of sweet potatoes, if you want to grow three pounds per foot of sweet potatoes, then you're going to want some irrigation. Some summers you might not need it, but most summers you're going to want to tide them over a few weeks when it gets dry and hot. It'll be a really good idea to just give them a couple inches of rain because they, while they're tolerant of drought, they will reward you for water in bigger and more bountiful harvest, just like every crop. So there we are using overhead irrigation. Um, so in our case, we tend to do deeper, longer irrigations for sweet potatoes as opposed to other crops like uh, lettuce and carrots, things like that, that, that prefer more frequent, shallower irrigation. We find that the sweet potatoes do really well with that long duration. We'll run, a, we'll run the sprinklers for three or four or six hours even, but just do that once a week or something. And that, that tends to work pretty well. 
And that's nice for us because it's a little easier for us to schedule that sort of thing than to have it go every day at a certain time. We can, we can look for a window of opportunity when we can give them a good shot of water. Okay, so irrigation, weeds. And let's talk a little bit about what's happening under there while the vines are growing out and these sweet potatoes are starting to form up. Uh, in a bigger picture, one of the reasons I love using sweet potatoes as a pioneer crop is because you've got this massive vine structure, and, and you can see this in our fields, where it's just covered wall to wall with vines. Once it gets going, it's this incredible canopy. And right there at that surface soil interface, the air soil interface, which normally would get really dry and stressed out in the summertime, you've got a really nice cover there that's continuing to give it shade and a little bit of boosted moisture, and you're having a lot of biological activity. So much so that usually that rye cover crop that we've talked about, that lovely mulch that's laid in place, and it starts out a couple inches thick, it's gone by the end of the season. It's completely decomposed. Our mulch compost, which I mentioned is, is mostly decomposed wood chips, oftentimes still has a pretty rough character. Um, by the time we're done with the sweet potatoes, it's usually very mellow and, and a beautiful dark rich composty soil. Uh, so this is why it's a great pioneer crop because it takes care of itself in a way that most crops won't. It's long season. It's actually building the soil underneath it because it's giving it that, uh, that interaction with the plants that continues to feed the microbes and keeps the moisture level right there at the surface, which you know many crops don't because there's, I, there's just not very many crops that have the sort of coverage that a sweet potato crop will have. So, so that's why I love using it as a pioneer crop. And so, uh, so we tend to use this in the places where, we, as we say, we've either fallowed or we haven't ever grown there. This is our first cash crop that we'll put in the ground in a new piece of ground. Okay, so there it is. All summer long, it's growing. It's enjoying the heat. Sweet potatoes love heat. In fact, one word of caution about planting sweet potatoes, don't push on that. There is no point in planting sweet potatoes out in cold, wet weather. Uh, not only will they not reward you for it, we've seen where they get stunted and they'll actually suffer for it the whole season long. Better to wait till it's nice and warm and pretty stable. Uh, better to plant sweet potatoes in really hot weather than cool weather. So, uh, so we often don't plant our sweet potatoes at all until that first week of June, which is also why it works so well to partner with that rye cover crop. Because that's about the time, the end of May is usually when we want to roller crimp that down and kill it. So there we are. They're enjoying the heat. We're giving them enough water to keep them growing. Um, every once in a while, I go out in the field and I'll just uncover a ridge a little bit, check out and see what's going on. I'm looking for two things. One, I want to make sure there's adequate moisture in the hills. If it's too dry, I definitely want to irrigate. And by too dry, I mean, if I can stick my finger in more than an inch and not come across a little bit of moisture that I feel like these are probably too dry, I probably need to do a little bit of watering. Now, the other thing I'm watching for is rodent damage. Now, this is a tricky one. There's not a whole lot to do about rodents, but I will tell you a couple of things that we've learned that seems to help. Rodents can really wipe out your sweet potatoes. They, they love, you know, the sweet potato grows in the ground like this, but this top part it's just barely under the ground. And the rodents love that. They can get right at that surface and they can chew away at it. And we've had numerous times when our sweet potato crops had significant damage. You know, sometimes as much as 50% had been impacted by rodent damage. So here's what we've learned. One is it helps if we have a clean field around us. And by clean, I mean mowed down and keep it short. I'm not generally a aggressive mower. I, I, I don't mind having some tall grass around. But the sweet potato field is one of the exceptions where I want to keep the, the grass mowed tight around the sweet potato field. And that seems to deter the rodents from crossing that boundary. They, they are liable to get predated on by raptors and things like that. So we want to keep it mowed down around the field. Secondly, it does seem to help to get those ground cover tarps out of there before they get really viney. They like getting underneath those ground cover tarps and it seems to give them an extra habitat boost. I was worried when we started doing the rye mulch that that would also boost the rodents, but we have not seen that. So in our experience, the mulch seems to be okay for that. But I am looking for that. So I'm going to go out in the field and make sure that's not happening. If it is happening, there's not a lot we can do, but we can try and address it with traps. You know, how effective that's going to be, hard to predict, but at least it's worth a try, right? So um, in that case, we'd have to look at what we're getting predated on, or the voles, rats, mice, whatever it might be, rabbits even, and we're going to adjust our trapping strategy accordingly. The final thing that people suggest, and I've, I've tried, I couldn't tell you that I've made a big difference with this, but people will talk about putting up raptor perches. And so what that would look like is just a pole next to your field, maybe several poles, 
Of course, if you've got dead trees next to the field, then having those up there, bare trees. But the idea is you're giving those raptors that are going to predate on those, uh, those rodents something to live in and clean up your field for you. But again, something to watch for. This is really the only major pest we have for sweet potatoes in our farm. We've not seen a lot of other problems. Every once in a while, Japanese beetles will be a little bit of a pest. But uh, there's so much sweet potato foliage that that's really not much of a problem. While we're talking about sweet potato foliage, I should also mention it's a secondary product. So we sell, not a lot, but a few hundred dollars worth of sweet potato vines a year as an edible green. And it's, it's delicious. If you haven't tried them, I highly recommend it. Just the leaves and petioles are the, the edible part. The stems are too tough, except for the, maybe the very, very tip where it's easily snapped. But, uh, but they're delicious. They're well known in Asia and Africa. It's just not a very North American thing to do to eat them. But if you can find a market for them, they're delightful. It does not seem that you impact the root production very much by removing a fair bit of vine. But also, as you can see, we have enough vine that it would be hard to imagine taking enough vine off of this to cause a real problem. And the one other thing I definitely need to mention is deer. So we talked about rodents. I've not really seen insect pests, but deer are the one thing that, that can do enough damage early enough to really cause an impact. So on our farm, the solution to that is, is dogs. In fact, you may be able to hear the dogs barking in the background. We have a, a bunch of guard dogs. And their job in the summertime is to guard the sweet potato patch, guard the green beans, guard the sweet corn, these things that are prone to deer and raccoons and possums, things like that. But deer in particular love sweet potato slips. So I really, I, I'm very diligent about keeping that guard dog out there in that field for at least the first month of the sweet potatoes growing. Um, after that, they seem to get to a point where they can kind of grow enough to overcome a little bit of deer predation. But that first month, the deer can easily move in and wipe out a whole row of sweet potatoes or, or worse yet, come in and wipe out random bits of your sweet potatoes uh, and really impact your, your yield. So sweet potatoes are delicious deer food, apparently, so you really got to guard them against that. We have used electric fence with some efficacy, but the dogs are really the, seem to be the, the right thing for our farm anyway. Okay, so if everything's gone well and we've had a great year this year, then we've had these uh, really bountiful vines. They look gorgeous. We've been checking on them every once in a while. And now uh, what I see nowadays when I go out and pull up a vine is I find something like this. And this is pretty typical. This is what you'll find. Now, these are a little stumpy. And sometimes they'll get obviously a lot longer. That may be a varietal difference. We have two different varieties in the field this summer, but also somewhat it is just that that's what sweet potatoes do. They'll grow a variety of sizes and shapes. So I'll go out and pull a few up, check what's going on. This is, usually I start checking them in, in this way by pulling them up about mid-September. And mostly that's just for my satisfaction, but it's nice to know they're under there, right? I don't usually want to dig sweet potatoes until October. And that's just a choice because they're going to continue to size up. They're, they're certainly ready to harvest at any point in September in terms of maturity. You could get sweet potatoes out of that. But, you know, what, what is, uh, say, this size in September is probably gonna be something more like this size by the middle of October. And so that's what we're giving up. Now, if this is your market, then this may be what you wanna do, right? But I'd love to grow these and sell these as much as possible. So, so I'm usually letting them size up. Even when you have these, you're still gonna have this mix. And so you can see there's some whoppers in here, but then there's also this, what you know, be classified as kind of a typical grocery store size. I don't know what the, what the grading term would be for that, but this is a jumbo. And then we've got some smalls here. And that's always the case. Uh, sweet potatoes just do that. They grow in a wide variety of sizes and there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to make sure that you can figure out where to market all that, right? And so, so how do we go about that? Well, we'll get to back to that in a second, but let's talk about harvest. We go out and first we're gonna have to trim the vines a bit because the vines tend to interlace. And so really what you've got is one giant mat of sweet potato vine across the whole field. So what we do is a very manual approach, but we'll start our way through a path and we'll pick up a handful of vines and then we'll cut them off either with a, a machete or a big knife or something. And we're just gonna work our way down the path that way. It's a little bit labor intensive, but actually once you get going, it's not, it doesn't take very long. Maybe it takes five or 10 minutes for a path. And uh, then we're gonna roll that vine back over the ridge so that we can get to the base of the ridge. And that seems to work best for us. So we're hacking along the path, we're rolling it back. So we've now exposed the top of the ridge and we're gonna go through and we're gonna clip off the top of those vines. Now we're not gonna wanna clip low enough to get into the sweet potatoes. So we're clipping say, you know, an inch and a half, two inches above the ground level, but we do wanna leave a stump. The nice thing about having a stump is then you can come back and find your potatoes here in a minute. So we're gonna clip off 
Uh, we'll use a knife or we'll use clippers, either way. Um, I prefer a knife. But we'll hack them off and then we're just gonna pull these guys out of the ground. And this is the magic of growing them in compost. This is part of why I love growing them as a pioneer crop because our soil in that compost ridge is so soft and loose that we can usually just pull the sweet potatoes right out with minimal digging. If there is any digging, it's just gonna be some sort of gripping it and pulling it out of the ground. It's very minimal. And so that's a real reward for us that, you know, all this hard work, getting the beds just right, getting the compost on there, uh, getting a plant in the right place, then makes the harvest a much easier game. We have grown them, you know, in the past in the ground and a much more, uh, a less ridged system. And of course, that's not that uncommon, but you definitely spend a lot more time in labor digging. And that's where things like a digging fork will come in, or even a, on a larger scale, you might use a tractor digger, either something like an undercutter, which we have used to some success, or you can use something like a, um, a chain digger, a single world potato digger would work. But a word of caution about both of those options. Um, sweet potatoes, when you go to harvest them, are extremely sensitive. They have super uh, soft skin. Now, after they've been out of the ground for a couple days, that changes completely. But when you first pull them out of the ground, just a minor, just sliding your thumb over it will remove all the skin from a spot. And while that will heal up if you manage to cure them correctly, it's much better never to have that damage in the first place, right? So, so this is part of why we like hand harvesting and part of why we like making them easy to hand harvest because if we have to really work at it and pull on them real hard, even with our hands, a lot of times we'll end up pulling some skin off. So, so we try and avoid that. All right, so then we're gonna set them up on top of the ridge. And if the weather cooperates, we're gonna let them sit on the top of the ridge for two or three days in the sun. The reason we like doing that is because of that skin. We like letting them dry out, cure out a little bit on top of the hill. They're not doing the full cure that we'd like them to in a, in a warm, humid environment, but it is toughening their skins a little bit and it makes a big difference in how much damage we do then as we move them into a bin. So the next part of the process is that we're gonna drive through the field. Now we've had these potatoes out of the ground for a couple days, so they're all laying on the surface. We'll usually drive down two beds at a time and we're gonna pick them up and put them into a pallet bin. So this is a pallet bin that'll hold about six to 700 pounds of sweet potatoes piled up and it's a deep bin. So it's going to hold a lot of potatoes and we'll just carry it. We'll just work our way down that path and lift those sweet potatoes. Now, reminder, these sweet potatoes are at this point still pretty tender. And so we're trying to be careful with them and not knock the skins off of them, not bruise them up. So we're setting them in the, in the bin. We're not chunking them and tossing them. We're just setting them in gently. Not quite as gentle as eggs, but maybe you're thinking about cantaloupe or watermelon or something like that. We're gonna be careful with them. We're gonna move those pallet bins into the greenhouse. So this is six or 700 pounds of sweet potatoes at a time. We can move them around on a pallet jack. The greenhouse is an ideal curing place for these sweet potatoes, because what we're trying to do is keep them around 80 degrees and high humidity for about 10 days. And during that time, what's gonna happen is their skins are gonna heal up. It's a pretty cool thing. You just remember that anytime you're storing vegetables, you are storing a live creature, right? You're, you're storing a live plant. And so we wanna give these live sweet potato roots an opportunity to heal up before we put them into cold storage or cool storage, we'll call it. And that works really well. So all these little nicks that you can see on these recently harvested sweet potatoes, these will dry up, they'll cure up. Oftentimes you can't even see them after a few days because they'll, they'll blend in with the rest of the potato. And once they do that, those nicks don't really seem to affect storage life at all. But if you put them into cool storage before that cures up, it will drastically affect their lifespan. Uh, Well-cured sweet potatoes should last easily six months. If in good storage conditions, sweet potatoes are incredibly durable. But if the curing process doesn't work or if they get too cold, then you definitely can impact that in a negative way. So here we go. Sweet potatoes curing in the greenhouse. We wanna keep them high humidity. Now, you know, some of our other things that we cure in the greenhouse, we're gonna put fans on. We don't do that with our sweet potatoes. In fact, sometimes if we feel like the conditions are getting dry, uh, if we have a dry October and, and our humidity is real low, we'll actually put a little plastic tarp over the top or a canvas tarp over the top of the sweet potatoes because we do want them to have high humidity. That's part of their curing process. High temperature, high humidity. Now, I don't have a way to keep that temperature up at night, or I should say I haven't devised a way to do that, and that still seems to work okay. I suspect that if we did you know, put a little heater under that tarp with them, that probably would be even better, but they, it seems to work okay for us that our nighttime temperatures are dropping down pretty cool in that greenhouse. As long as the daytime temperatures still get up there pretty good and we get some heat into those potatoes, it seems to work fine.
After they've been in there 10 days to two weeks, we're gonna move them into storage. Now, reminder, sweet potatoes are not a cold storage crop, right? So most of our long storage crops, we're gonna keep right at freezing temperature, but sweet potatoes and winter squash are the exceptions. Sweet potatoes and winter squash wanna be held between 55 and maybe as high as 65 degrees. So a cool room temperature, right? Root cellar temperature. But we do wanna keep an eye on that. We don't want it to get cold. Cold will definitely damage your sweet potatoes. In fact, anything below 50, and you can start to develop something called hard core, which is where sweet potatoes will actually not cook and they will not soften up. They'll, they'll stay hard despite your best efforts to cook them. You don't want that to happen. So you keep your sweet potatoes above 55. In our case, what that looks like is a, a big walk-in cooler that has a cooling unit that's set at 58 degrees, but we'll also put a heater in there to keep things from getting below 50. And that's a pretty good system, tends to work pretty well. Sweet potatoes don't need a lot of air circulation, but because we have other things in there as well, we do have a couple fans in there just to keep the air moving around, but we don't wanna dry them out. It's not our goal. Uh, sweet potatoes are fine with some humidity. They don't have super thick skin, so we don't wanna give them a drying environment or they will shrivel up. So those will hold really well. Our experience confirms other people's experience, which is sweet potatoes will hold easily for six months. They really hold well. Now, you'll have a little bit of spoilage in that time. You'll almost always be able to trace that spoilage to some sort of damage that happened, but they are incredibly durable. And one of the reasons why they're such a great crop to grow is because you can put these in storage and now we've got six months to sell them. And that means that we get to be price givers instead of price takers, right? So we get to say, well, I'll sell you these sweet potatoes, but I need to get $1.50 or $2 a pound for them. And if somebody's not ready to pay that, that's okay. We can sell them to them next week or a week, a week later, we can find a different market, right? And to me, that's a really valuable piece of this puzzle. This is a big part of why sweet potatoes are such a great crop for us. In dollars per foot out of the beds, they're not the most profitable crop that we grow. They do have very low labor requirements, so that's a big reward for us. And they have this durability, and so that's a big reward. So, so for, for example, lettuce, we might be able to, to grow $12 a square foot on a bed of lettuce. Whereas sweet potatoes, you know, we'll be doing pretty good if we get $2 a square foot. However, at $2 a square foot for the labor investment and the fact that it's improving my soil and the fact that it's gonna, I'm gonna be able to hold it and sell it over a six month period, that starts to look a lot better. So that's why we found a really good place for sweet potatoes on our farm uh, in any given year. It's become a really nice stabilizer. As long as we have a good sweet potato crop, we have some cash coming in all winter long. And I've known several other small farms. And remember, I'm only a two and a half acre garden here. So it's a pretty small space we're growing in. I've known several other farms of my scale that have found sweet potatoes to still be a really viable crop, despite their relatively low return per square foot for those other reasons. Low labor, long storage time, a lot of marketability. So anyway, that's the story on sweet potatoes on the farm. Now, remember, if you've got a great crop, then you're gonna to wanna to hold a couple of bushels for slip production the next spring. And, and I will mention that for years I bought slips. I would strongly recommend that once you get your sweet potatoes looking good and, and growing well, grow your own slips from your own potatoes. Now, obviously you wanna watch for any sort of infirmity, any sort of scurf, any sort of disease. If anything that doesn't look right, you obviously would not want to plant that for your slips in the future. And if so, then it's fine to buy more potatoes. But there's really no reason to buy slips. You can absolutely grow slips from your own potatoes or potatoes you buy and have really good results. And in fact, our experience has been that those slips that we grow on farm are far superior to what we could get shipped to us. So I guess the only reason really to buy slips would be if you wanted to get a variety that you couldn't find otherwise. And that's a viable reason. But after that, you can grow your own slips. That is sweet potatoes on Millsap Farm. Important crop for us. It's a really long season crop, but it's one of those crops that we have found to be a, a real winner year after year. And, and it's a long enough season that it also can overcome some of the vagaries of a season. So if it starts out a little cool and wet or it starts out a little hot and dry, it seems to not affect the sweet potatoes too much because they've got such a long season to do their job in that they can usually find that window to grow and produce a nice crop. So thanks for watching. Sweet potatoes on Millsap Farm. Thank you for joining farmer Curtis Millsap and myself for this video on sweet potato production. For more information on growing specialty crops, visit the WebCityFarmersMarket.com website. This project was made possible in part by funding from the Missouri Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Grant Program and is a joint program of University of Missouri Extension, Lincoln University Cooperative Extension, and the Web City Farmers Market.